It's at getting a basis for a span. And we realized these three vectors were not independent. And we decided to throw away one vector by showing that it's a linear combination of the other ones. So that's how we chose to throw out a vector. So we can find a basis for a span in a similar way, but this will be more uh, formulaic. So let's answer the same question, but in a slightly different way. So find a base, basis for span of <clears throat> 3, negative 1, 5, 2, 1, 3, and 0, negative 5, 1. And we call this S. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a matrix, but instead of writing these as columns in our matrix, we're going to write them as rows. So we're going to form a base uh, matrix with these as rows. And if we give these names, we'll call the first vector u, second one is v, third one is w. So our matrix, we'll call it capital A. So the first row, we can write it as u transpose. Second row will be v transpose, and third row will be w transpose. And the transpose operator that takes our matrix and swaps the rows and the columns. So it's easy to do on a column or a row matrix. So it'll just take this and turn it into a row matrix. So we're just transposing. So this matrix A, first row will be 3, negative 1, 5, second row. 2, 1, 3, third row 0, negative 5, 1. So now, S, is S the row space or the column space of this matrix? I think we wrote those definitions down one page back or two pages back, hopefully. like it's not in this set. Oh, row and column space section. There we go. All right, row space, the vector space spanned by the rows. So the span is the row space of this matrix. So S equals row space. of A, which we can abbreviate as row of A. And guess what we're about to do with this matrix? Row reduce. So like we always do. So what we're going to try to do is eliminate one row, then simplify the remaining rows and the remaining rows are going to form a basis. So all we're going to do is perform row operations, which <coughs> are swap rows. So obviously swapping rows is not going to change the row space. You're just changing the order of the, of the vectors. So a swap is not going to change our row space. The other operation is multiply by a non-zero vector or non-zero scalar. That's clearly not going to change our row, sp uh, row space. The span is not going to change. And the third operation, it's a little harder to see, but if you add a multiple of one row to another, that does not change the row space. So that's not entirely obvious, but if you think about what the span actually is, it's all linear combinations of these three vectors. So what we previously did is we looked at a combination of the first two that led us 
not use a third. So we're going to do the same operations, except we're going to do them in a matrix. So everything we do is going to be analogous. We're just going to do it all inside of a matrix. So we're going to row reduce A to eliminate. Now when I say eliminate, I mean turn it into all zeros. So we're not going to get rid of it. We're just going to zero it out to eliminate. So turn two zeros. So to eliminate as many rows as possible. So in this case, we know that we only need two vectors. So we should be able to eliminate exactly one row. So go ahead and eliminate any row you want. This is slightly different than what we're used to doing because our goal is to eliminate a row, not to reduce a column. So there's one, one, and the rest zeros. So you know all the moves to make, but our goal is a little bit different this time. So what I recommend you do is go in the regular pattern that you're used <coughs> to going. Just reduce it in the regular way, and hopefully one of the rows will turn into zeros along the way. So any row operation questions? So is this a basis? There's two properties a basis has to have. One of them is linear independence. So when there's only two vectors, they're going to be independent if they're not zero and they're not multiples of each other. So I can't take one, multiply it by a scalar, and get the other one. So that should be pretty obvious. They're independent. Now the more tricky part, is this an actual basis for our original set S? So what other property does a basis have aside from independence? So the span of the basis should be all the, in this case, the span of uh, the other three vectors. So there's two basis properties. So we have linear independence, and the second one is it spans the vector space. All right, so we're going to check that it actually spans the vector space. So our set S is the span 
of the original three vectors. Three, negative one, five, two, one, three, and zero, negative five, one. So now we want to show that we can make anything in the span. So all we really have to do is check if we can make the three vectors from a combination of our basis vectors. So that's what we're going to do. Can I generate these three vectors? All right, the third vector is super easy. The third vector, 0, negative 5, 1. How do I make that vector? I just go and grab the 0, 5, negative 1 vector and multiply by what scalar? Negative 1. So I got the negative of the vector I want. Boom. That's the easiest linear combination right there. If you really want to be uh, write a combination of both vectors, well, it's 0 times the other vector. But I think that's you could probably skip that part on this right here. All right, so that's the third vector we just got as this linear combination. Let's look at that 2, 1, 3. How in the world can we get that? Surface to show the three vectors above are in the span of our basis, which is one negative two two zero five negative one. So we just showed our third vectors in there. Now we're going to go with the 2, 1, 3. Now I don't know, these are going to be a little bit more tricky. So how do I solve this linear system? So we got three linear equations and two variables. So we can put it into a matrix and solve it. I put the constant on the wrong side. We usually write it on the right side. So we'll just flip the equation around like that. So this is the same problem we did, I think, week one or two. So let's go and figure out alpha one and alpha two. Quick question. Yep. For your basis, is it possible to have different Yes, there's an infinite number of correct bases. Okay. So I can multiply these two vectors by any non-zero scalars. And that right there is an infinite number of choices. And I can actually pick completely different vectors. Okay. So I think our span the previous time, we got different vectors than this. At least one of them was different. So you should get alpha 1 is 2, alpha 2 is 1. Any operation questions? 
Let's look at our original situation at the top of the board. How could I see that alpha 1 had to be 2 without doing any actual algebra? It has everything to do with a 0 being at the top of our second vector. So what's the only way to get a 2 over here? <coughs> alpha 1 has to be 2. So sometimes if there's a 0, you can exploit it a little bit and then see what one of your coefficients is. So let's try on the third one to do a little less algebra and a little more um, intuition. So we're looking to get our third vector now. Our third vector, well, it's really our first vector, the way they are written. All right, let's do this with intuition only, no algebra allowed. What should alpha one equal? So alpha one is three, it's the only way to get three because alpha two cannot give you any uh, non-zero entries in the x-coordinate. All right, now that you know alpha 1 is 3, let's look at the second row right here. So just look at the second row. So we got 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, plus what is negative 1? So negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1. So alpha 2, oops, alpha 2 has to equal 1. So any questions on that? So I don't necessarily recommend using intuition to avoid algebra, especially in a linear algebra class. But I think on this one, because there was a 0, it was reasonable to do that. If that was not a zero, I don't think that would be a good choice right there. So we just saw that there was a second basis. So we just checked off all three vectors. So we can get all three of these vectors. So this basis does span the set uh, S. Here's our basis written down. Now our basis previously was 3, negative 1, 5, and 2, 1, 3. So you can have multiple bases. There's an infinite number of correct choices for a basis, as long as, you're, as long as there's more than zero dimensions in your space. So only if your space is zero dimensional, uh, then your basis has basically no vectors in it. But that's a trivial case. As long as your dimension of your space is one or more, there's an infinite number of choices for your basis. And if it's two or more, your basis vectors may not look the same at all from different bases. So you could be answering a homework question of what's the basis, and the vector space might be exactly the same as my homework question, but we get completely different bases, and they can both be correct. All you have to do is make sure you have independence, and the span is all of your vector space. Time for a theorem. So we have an M by N matrix. B will be an N dimensional vector. Such that AX equals B. So exactly one statement is true about x. All right, so before I write the statements down, I want you to figure out what dimension x has. And I'll narrow it down. It's either m or n dimensional. So how do we figure out the dimension of x? 
super important is that product right there, AX equals B. So you know one dimension of X because it's multiplied by A. So your inner dimensions have to match. And you know your other dimension by looking at B. So let's do a dimensional analysis over here. So A is M by N. I don't know what X is, but B is in N dimensional space. So there will be N rows and one column. So figure out the dimension of X. That should be enough information right there. Inner dimensions have to match when you multiply. Outer dimensions give you the dimension of the product. Uh oh. I think we have a problem. Yeah, B should be an RM. So X has to be N by one so that our inner dimensions match and the outer dimensions are the dimensions of B. So X is in RM. Oops, RN. All right, so let's get back to the theorem now. So one statement will be true about X. And the first one that could be true, there is no such X. So that's also known as inconsistent. Or no solution. So second possibility, there is a unique solution. And third possibility, there are infinite solutions. So we looked at part A, there's no such X. So if you try to row reduce, you would get a row of zeros followed by non-zero. That's how A would look. What, so B and C both have a solution or lots of solutions. What is distinguishing between B and C? So if you were doing row reduction, what would you expect to see at the end if you got down to infinite solutions? Free variables. So our free variables, if there's free variables, you have C. If there's no free variables and there is a solution, you have B. So here in part B, we have no free variables. Last part, we have uh, one or more free variables. So that's the end of the theorem. Row uh, operations preserve the row space. So that's why when we put our vectors into a matrix, we put them in as rows because we're going to do row operations. And when we perform row operations, the row space didn't change. So what that let us do is reduce things and then take the reduced rows and then that was our span. So if row operations preserve the row space, what do you think preserves the column space? Column operations. column operations. 
So you could do column operations and preserve your column space if you want to. So we're used to doing row operations, so I recommend that you use row operations by looking at row space. So put in your uh, factors in as rows if you want to find a basis. And then do row reduction, and then you will find a hopefully smaller set and use that. So another consequence of row space and column spaces. The row space of A is the column space of the transpose. So if you transpose a matrix, rows become columns, so of course row space becomes column space. And of course you could Start out with column, and that would be your row space of the transpose. So to find a basis for column space of A, So you have two choices. Your first option. So first option, what we did is you could transpose the matrix. So transpose A. And then row reduce. And then your non zero rows are the basis vectors. So that's exactly what we did for the example problem at the beginning. We took our vectors and instead of putting them in as columns, we transposed them, put them in as rows. So that's exactly what we did. There's another option. You could do everything as columns. So you could uh, perform column operations. On a to column reduce. And then your non zero columns are basis vectors. Let's take that same matrix that we looked at before, and instead of finding the column space, we're going to find the row space. find the column space. We already found the what did we find? Found the basis for the span. Oh dang, I'm writing down the transpose of the matrix. Oh that's why. So our original A matrix First column three, negative one, five, then two, one, three, zero, negative five, one. 
So we already found the column space of this matrix. Let's find the row space now. So you just do same thing, but without Yep, so we're just going to reduce, and then uh, hopefully there will be a row of zeros, and we'll just choose the other two. So you're going to perform row operations, no transpose needed this time. So we're finding the row space. So I find the row space by uh, finding a basis. What's that? Yeah, I want to go, wow, the other way. Oh no, so I'm copying off my notes, not off what's on the screen right now. There we go. That's probably better. Oh no. Yeah, I think the negative five are too strong. Oh no. Oh, 
Oh jeez, which seven? The one on the top. All right, so does that look good then? So we need to somehow get this five and eight out of here. Looks like the last, both of these we can multiply by a nice Number zero one negative three uh, positive one negative one positive five Oh yeah. It doesn't always erase quickly. Alright, so this should knock out row 3, by subtracting row 1. So this matrix right here I could stop, but let's go ahead and make an even nicer basis. I can reduce column 1 a little bit more, so we'll go plus row 1. And that's as good as it's going to get. So row space of A is the span. Now we're looking at row space here, so I am taking rows. So our first vector will be the first row, 0, 1, negative 3. Second vector, 1, 0, 2. So if you can try to get your span, uh, your bases to have vectors that have more coordinates that are zero. So I did my last row operation, so my second basis vector would look a little nicer. Not necessary, but if you try to find a linear combination, your life will be a little easier if you have more zeros in your basis vectors. So ready for our basis theorem? So for a vector space, let's not use V, we'll use S for a vector space. Any basis will have the same number of vectors. This number is called the dimension. Dimension of S is the number of basis vectors. And it doesn't matter which basis you look at, every basis should have the exact same number of vectors inside of it. It may have different vectors, but the number of vectors will be the same. And that's called the dimension of your space. Another equality or another theorem is the dimension of the row space is equal to the dimension of the column space. And 
then the rank of a matrix so write it as rank of A and that's going to be the dimension of the row space of A uh, we know it's also equal to the dimension of the column space of A so you can go either way So dimension and rank seem like the same thing. The dimension is a product of a vector space, whereas rank is a pro uh, property of a matrix. But they're talking, they're the exact same idea. And also if you transpose your matrix, so rank of A is the same as rank of A transpose. So if you transpose your matrix, you still get the same uh, number of dimensions in your row space. And last up, nullality or null. So is the dimension of the null space? So is this only on the square matrix? Uh, it works for any, any size matrix. Yeah, we'll be doing some examples here uh, soon. Not today, but well, no, we'll do a little example today. So nullality of a matrix is a dimension of the null space. So you can write it as dimension of null of A. That's the nullality. And now, I was about to say our last theorem, but no. Last theorem of this page. So if A is an M by N matrix, then nullality of A plus rank of A will equal N. Now this may seem a little bit strange. What I'm gonna do is write out a, well I'm not gonna write out an actual matrix, just, let's see, M rows and N columns. So if you do row reduction, let's say uh, n is greater than m in this example, greater than or equal to, and if everything works out nicely, you'll get ones down here, and then you'll get some stuff after that, assuming that your matrix is wider than it is tall. That's what it will look like. And in this situation where n is bigger, in this case, Basically your null space dimension will, so that's null space dimension, will be right there, and your rank will be out here. So you'll see your rank and next to your null space. And that is basically what this theorem is saying. The null space plus the rank is the number of columns. That's exactly what this is saying. Another way to think about it, your column 
either contributes to a, uh, a vector to the basis of your column space or it doesn't. If it contributes a vector to the basis, then it counts into the rank, and if it doesn't contribute, meaning it's either could be reduced to zeros or is a uh, linear combination of other ones, then that would contribute to the null space. Now, of course, lots of matrices have less columns than rows. So what happens in that case? If you have less columns than rows, it's a little bit less clear. So let's look at that. If n is smaller than m, so your matrix is going to be tall and narrow in this case. So no matter what, you're going to run out of ones before you get to the bottom few rows down here. But remember, we're looking at the column space in this case. So if we're looking at the column space, it doesn't really matter that we ran out down here at the bottom because we're looking at columns right here. So we're looking at columns. So really all this comes down to is if you couldn't get one, if you can get ones all the way over, your rank will be the number of columns, meaning the null space is uh, nothing or just the zero. Uh, vector space. If you ran out of ones before you got all the way over, so you got to some zeros, however many zeros you got, in this case, that's your null space, the dimension of your null space right there. And the rank will be the columns that uh, would start with one. So that's all the this theorem is looking at. It's basically deciding as a column contribute to the rank or does it contribute to the null. So that's all this theorem is doing. And depending on how your matrix looks, of course, in our big matrix here, I may not have this many ones. It's possible that these right here were zeros. In this case, I would have a much smaller rank and a way bigger null space. So depending on how far over your ones go, the further over they go, the bigger your rank is. And what's to the right of those, that'll all be the null space. So that's how you want to think about this theorem right here. It's just basically partitioning columns. So we'll do one more example. We're going to compute the null space of A, where A is that matrix that we just looked at a few different times. All right, how do we find null space? What is null space? It's been a little while. So it'll look like columns of zeros after we're done. Well, and remember, it, the whole column doesn't need to be zeros. So in these columns here, you could have non-zeros above. So it doesn't have to be full columns of zeros. All right, what is the null space? been a while. Hopefully it's in your notes or in your cheat sheet. <coughs> so I just wrote it down in set notation. It's all factors x such that a times x is zero. That's your null space. That should definitely be on your cheat sheet. Good chance you see null space on your next quiz. And if it's on your next quiz, it's on the next quiz. And should definitely be on the midterm. And somehow if it's not on any of those, it'll definitely be on the final. So you'll see null space, guaranteed. So let's go ahead and figure out what is the null space. Before we do that, what's going to be the dimension of this space? You have this theorem we just looked at. 
and we already computed the rank. What dimension was our column space slash row space of this matrix? How many elements were in the basis? Two. So we know the dimension of our column space will be two. What's the dimension of the null space have to equal? So up there on the top of the board, n is three. So rank is two, nullality is one. So we're looking for a one dimensional subspace, which will be our null space. And unfortunately, we have to wait till tomorrow. So we'll compute this tomorrow. It's easy to compute. You, can, you already have the algebra skills to do it. We've probably computed null spaces already.